who I have actually known for 17 years when we spent a summer together working at summer camp. Um, Caroline Lee uh, has been reading romance novels for so long that her fourth grade teacher used to make her cover her books with paper jackets. But it wasn't until relatively recently uh, and that she grew up that she realized she could write it too. So she did and currently has 65 published works and counting. Caroline lives is living her own happily ever after in North Carolina with her husband and three children. And she is a member of the class of 2003. So without further ado, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Um, OK, first of all, Amy, uh, thank you so much for thinking of me and inviting me. I am tickled to be here. As uh, Amy said, I've known her for uh, 70 years. <laughs> So uh, when she reached out to me, I was just, just thrilled to join you. I don't really have an outline. I know what I want to say in sort of notes, so I'll be like looking down here, but uh, you, you, get, you get what you get. I like to ramble. I love to talk. If you've got questions, please uh, put them in the, in the text, as Amy said, and we're going to answer below. I'm going to keep an eye on the time so that I don't ramble too long. Let's see. Okay, so as Amy said, my name is Caroline Lee. I write history with heart. That's my hashtag. My website is carolineleeromance.com. And I'd love it if you wanted to tootle on over there and check out some of my books. I have 65 books out in this pen name right now. I write primarily in three different genres, which is actually unusual. Most people pick one pen name and pick one um, genre and stick with it. Mine are sort of related. So about a third of my books are contemporary romance, uh, which means they're set in present day, which is really cool because you get to write about airplanes and cell phones and stuff like that. <laughs> These are some of the books from the Rivers and Ranch series. I don't have any of the ones that are currently being published right now. I'm currently writing the Cowboys of Cauldron Valley just an idea. So again, about a third of these books are, are contemporary. Just because I like to talk about spice levels, I will, and when we say spice in romance, we mean um, the amount of naughty bits that are in them. Uh, the contemporary books are sweet. There's no naughty bits in them. <laughs> about a third of my books are uh, historical westerns. So I have some fabulous books uh, that are more uh, Zorro meets Maverick, you know, really action-y, adventure -y. I've got a bunch of books that are reimagined fairy tales. As you can see, we've got Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella. These are just random ones I grabbed, okay? I think I've got 10 of them in this series. And my newest endeavor is uh, historical Scottish books, okay? I've got uh, three series going on right now. This is the one that's happening right now called The Hots for Scots. It's a uh, hilarious spoof. So if you are a fan of historical romance and you understand the parameters of historical romance, you would really enjoy reading The Hots for Scots series just because I love to make fun of everything. <laughs> Um, lots of naughty humor in those. So my Scottish books are very, very spicy. My contemporary books are very, very sweet, to give you an idea. Uh, Amy was just telling me that she started reading my Hots for Scots series, and she said, wow, these are very different. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's what I'm currently working on right now. I'd just like to give you a little background of what, uh, what kind of books I have published, what I am publishing right now, and what I have published in the past. I'll talk about my publishing history a little bit and a little um, to give you an idea. But that sort of is uh, starting us off of why I'm here. Now, I will warn you that everything I'm going to talk about today, I'm doing with the, within the parameters of romance. Romance is the fiction that I know best and I know most about. I know some of you are here because you're my fans and you've read me and I said, hey, I'm doing this and come, come watch me. Some of you are here because you want to write a book. 
Some of you are here because you have written a book and want to know about publishing. And some of you are here just because you're readers and like want to know what's going on behind the scenes. And that's super cool and amazing. And I'm really excited. Uh, but just be warned that what I'm talking about is, um, ro is fiction from a romance, romantic fiction point of view. I have to assume it's the same <laughs> for other genres, but I'm not, I'm not going to 100% guarantee that. Okay. Before I get talking about publishing, I wanted to talk about how I got here, sort of the background, which knowing me will sort of meander into the foreground and become. <laughs> <laughs> relevant. I went, I graduated Lafayette College in 2003. I studied history there. I studied under uh, Professor Andy Fix, who passed away a couple of years ago. So if you remember Professor Fix, it was a lot of um, medieval European history. Uh, from there, I went, I went to work, but then I went to grad school. I, went, I attended grad school at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia where I studied um, comparative world history. Comparative world history is the study of themes throughout history, which is basically social history. And I don't know how, mm, social history is the study of the lives people led instead of the events which shaped their lives. Does that make sense? So we're not talking about um, specific battles or elections or assassinations, we're talking about what people ate for dinner and what they, um, how they structured their day, what they wore, what they might have believed in, how they divided responsibilities, that sort of thing. I think I've gotten off track <laughs> already. <laughs> okay, anyhow, the point is social history, compared to world history is the lives people led, not the events which shaped their lives. Okay, while I was at George Mason University, I focused on women's history as a, um, a general social history, and I focused specifically on the history of marriage, which was, you know, really cool, because I was really into that. I've studied uh, marriage across three, four continents, the history of marriage of the last 200 years, that sort of thing. And at the same time, meanwhile, I'm reading these books. And as Amy said, I've been reading these books for a really long time to the point where for years, I didn't even realize there was another kind of romance except for historical romance, right? Because that was, that was what I loved. It was a fascination for me, not the naughty bits. <laughs> the, the, li the lives, that's what it comes down to is the lives of these people. So you're reading, you pick up a historical romance and you're getting inside the brains of these people that lived 800 years ago. And that's so cool, right? And, and you know, you're of course getting the plot and the excitement and everything like that, but you're reading about what they read and what they ate and what they're doing. And wow, this is, look how this is how you churn butter and stuff like that. <laughs> so this is when it all kind of came together in my mind we're studying social history. Well, historical fiction is applied social history. So that's how you apply it. You learn all this cool stuff about how they lived and then you apply it with historical fiction to be able to get inside their brains. And that's how we get books about like Anne Boleyn and, you know, Henry VIII and, and we're getting inside their brains. And it's, it's really cool to like imagine what it was they could have been thinking based on what we study, what we know of their lives. And that's when I realized that historical romance is, I'm sorry, I'm biased, but the best kind of historical fiction. <laughs> because historical romance always ends happily ever after. That's what's so cool about it. So you're reading historical fiction, you're reading about Anne Boleyn, and it doesn't always end happily ever after, right? Because it's history. But then we get this really cool historical romance where we're getting inside these characters' brains from 800 years ago and they always end up in love and married and living long, healthy, happy lives together. Anyhow, obviously I'm very passionate about it. It's cool. Okay, I just rambled through all of those sections, sorry. All right, obviously I'm pretty excited about that kind of stuff. That's why I write historical romance because it's a lot of fun and it's cool and it always ends happy. So I'm gonna talk about sort of the logistics and the nitty gritty 
of publishing. But first, let me, I guess this is just a, um, a note. I'm going to talk a lot about Kindles. Um, this is one of, I think I've got three reading Kindles and a bunch of backup Kindle fires. I, I, I mean, I read a lot. That's what I do. Um, when I'm talking about Kindles, when I'm talking about eBooks, I'm not necessarily talking just about Kindle eBooks from Amazon. I'm talking about um, books, Barnes and Noble Nook, uh, Apple iBooks, Kobo is really popular up in Canada, depending where you are. The eBook revolution. I've got some nitty gritty behind it. I think that Amazon's Kindle was the first and they are the real the real game changer. But just know that I'm talking about all sorts of ebooks. So the Kindle came on the scene and it got really popular in what, 2011? And I don't know who here reads, well, I can only see like 12 of you, but I don't know who, who reads on Kindle. <laughs> okay, like lots and lots of people read on, on ebooks, mainly on Kindle. Clearly I love it. I have always loved paperbacks. I'm, I'm never going to give up my paperbacks. I love the feel of the paperback in my hand. And I know so many people who agree with that, but you cannot deny the, the power of being able to carry a million books literally in your back pocket or purse, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I love being able to, to go someplace and know that I've got my, my books on my phone, right? Because my Kindle app is on my phone. That's, that's really amazing. This is a revolution in, in so many ways, but it's a revolution in how we publish books and it's a revolution in how we interact with books. And as readers, because I'm assuming you're a reader, I'm a reader. Um, oh, Shane tells me the Kindle came out in November, 2007. I was way off. There you go, history. <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I believe the sort of heyday started in 2010, 2011, but I might be wrong. If it happened less than 100 years ago, you know me. <laughs> uh, okay, but they, they revolutionized how we interact with our books as readers. We 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 have we are instantly gratified and we know in society today that that's like we're we're keen on that right but okay i've got a book that amazon is is delivering me this week a paperback book from one of my favorite authors i pre-ordered that book last summer so i have been waiting on this book for a year and i mean it's worth it i'm really excited about that book that's going to be so cool but if you as a reader or me as a reader see a, a Kindle book, an ebook that I want, I press buy and bam, like it's on a minute later. I don't have to wait a year. A minute later, it's, it's on my Kindle. If you pre-order one of my books, if you say, oh, Caroline, I, you know, your upcoming book looks great. I'll, I pre-order all of my books. So you can go check out any of them. That looks really great. I'd like to buy that. 12.01 a.m., that book will be waiting on your Kindle. Instant gratification, it's so cool. Okay, but a lot to be said about paperback books, right? Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you the brief history of how I became an author, and then we're gonna talk about the different kinds of publishing. Uh, not necessarily ebook versus paperback, because they are actually similar paths. Uh, but okay, <laughs> to, to give you the background, uh, I, I, like, the, I've been reading for my whole life, uh, re reading historical romance my whole life. I have always had stories in my head. And that's something that will 100% uh, you're going to find with all authors. And many of you might be like that. That might be what, what attracts you to fiction is the fact that you, you're telling, you, you've always told stories in your head. I'm often, the number one question I'm asked is how do you come up with your stories? And my response is like sort of incredulous. How do you not have four stories going in your brain at any one point? Like they're, they're just, they have to be told. I was in a very short attention span. <laughs> I didn't write my first book until I was at Lafayette and then it was like 
12 pages and I was very proud of myself. I could write 50 page term papers, no problem. But um, it took me a little while to work up the, uh, <laughs> the attention span to be able to write a book beginning to end. So, oh, if you are, okay, here's, here's a tip. If you are interested in writing and you sort of have the same issue I had, uh, join NaNoWriMo. Have you all heard of that? It's the Na National, National Novel Writing Month. It's the month of November, NaNoWriMo, that encourages you to write 50,000 words in a month. And that's at the beginning, like that's mind blowing to be able to write a thousand, it's actually 1,666 words a day. And then, and then by the end of November, you have a 50,000 word book. That's wow, that's so cool. So I started doing that. Uh, I thought that was really neat. I wrote uh, my first couple of books via NaNoWriMo. Um, they ended up being like 150,000 words. <laughs> oh, I actually had a visual for that. To give you an idea of thousand words, these are, this is a mass media paperback book. I read a lot of sci-fi. Um, these are the books that you are gonna see like in your grocery store. Okay, you see how thick it is? This, I don't know off the top of my head. Oh look, it's got a borders receipt in it. Uh, off the top of my head, um, maybe 90,000 words. Sci-fi is usually longer, so maybe not. Romance, it's about this length, maybe 90,000. Uh, my books tend to be a little shorter, short attention span, see? So I've got like, um, in that same size, mine would be maybe 70,000, anywhere between 30,000 and 70,000. This one I think is 25,000. You see how thin it is? I had a point for telling you that. It had something to do with NaNoWriMo. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, two NaNoWriMo's, you get one, uh, one mass media paperback size. If you are ever interested in writing 50,000 words, that's the way to do it. So anyhow, I wrote, I wrote books. I didn't particularly want to share them. I still haven't shared them, those first books that I read. But then I started paying more attention to the industry and Harlequin put out a call for books. And Harlequin is the, uh, one of the big romance publishers, right? And they wanted, they had a hundred thousand word book that they were going to publish five stories in. So they were doing, they did a call for 20,000 word stories, Christmas stories, Westerns. Well, I can do that. I, I can do that. Let me try it. So I wrote it and it was, I thought pretty good. And I submitted it and it was not accepted. And I wasn't like completely surprised. I'd had quite a few rejections by that point. And that's okay because everybody, you know, you have to go through that. But I'm, I'm sitting there holding this book in my hand and I thought, this is a pretty good story, Caroline. Like, what should we do with this? This deserves to be read. And then I thought, well, the internet is out there and the internet likes to read, right? So let's find a forum and like put the book up on the forum. Maybe somebody will want to read it. I didn't, I mean, it didn't, I just wanted to share my work with somebody. Just, it was a good story. Okay. And uh, what kind of, what kind of forums? I don't know. I'm not cool enough to like be on any forums or understand the internet or anything. Uh, I married a tech guy, but he didn't know any <laughs> romance novel forums either. <laughs> so, but the, the year before he had given me a Kindle. Not this one. I think it was literally like 35 Kindles ago. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just put it up for Kindle, right? How hard could that be? It's super easy. That's the answer. Super easy. So I get on Amazon uh, and I figure out how to do this and I, I publish my book and I get to the last story. It was a story, not a full book. But I get to the last section. It says, do you want to, how much do you want to charge for this? And I said, nothing. It's free. Just make it free. That's fine. And they said, no, 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 Caroline, you have to charge. Oh, okay, uh, 99 cents, I guess. That was the lowest they amount. So I, I put it in for 99 cents and people bought it. <laughs> and, and that was amazing to me. So I like to say that I accidentally fell into publishing. Uh, I am, well, I get into the different kinds of publishing, but uh, the next year I did the exact same thing again, much longer. I wrote a longer book. Again, it was a Christmas book. Uh, Christmas historical Westerns are very popular. They are very feel good, warm and fuzzy family oriented, um, old fashioned Christmas sort of thing. So I have like 12 of them. <laughs> I like writing them. I like reading them. People like reading them. Maybe not 12, maybe it's like five. 
so the following year I wrote another Christmas story and that one was like off the charts well not off the charts but for me it was like amazing was, oh, people said you need you need more of this series so the following year was 2014 and I published three books in that series in 2014 I thought I was hot stuff okay it was hot stuff I guess but in 2015 I don't remember how many I published by 2016 I was pu I published 10 books 2017 I published 12 books maybe that was 2018 but like you see how each each year I'm publishing more and more books. Last year I published 16 and I was like, that was mind blowing to me that I could publish 16 books. And we'll put a pin in that because we'll t talk about how I can do that. This year I am on track to publish 22 books. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'm getting one really good response over there. Like, I know, right? Um, I have, I, I have, I have to go get so many hand massages because my hands hurt so much. I'm writing so much, but I have to tell you that it, uh, we all went into quarantine in, in March and April, right? And if you're a reader and I'm a reader, what else are we going to do except watch movies and read books, right? So this was, I, 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 I have published on average two books a month this year because we've got some fantastic series that are going on and and we we want to know what happens i want to know what happens too <laughs> so that's why that's my story of how i how i started publishing and then now kick butt at it <laughs> uh to give you some background um if you're curious if this is viable i i don't talk numbers you'll rare, rarely do authors talk numbers uh but i last year my husband quit his job to come home and market for me and take care of the kids uh I have for the last uh I've been self-sufficient for years now and starting last year I now make enough to support the entire family this is a I this is a career it's a job uh there are aspects of it that still make me absolutely giddy there are some aspects of it that are just a complete slog uh marketing uh that sort of thing that you just you have to do um, I keep getting distracted. I'm sorry. <laughs> the little, little chat keeps popping up and I'm like, Ooh, that's a good point, but I'm not going to answer it until the end. <clears throat> okay. I promised that I would talk about the two different kinds of publishing. I'm going to talk about traditional publishing first, and then I'm going to talk about indie and self-publishing second, which is what I do. And then that'll lead into um, sort of how indie publishing works. Okay, so um, traditional publishing is what we think of when we think of publishing. This is the, 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 the books that you have seen everywhere. The books that we grew up reading. The books up until about 2010 or 2007, as Sean pointed out to me, <laughs> Um, the, the, this is how we read our books, right? And they're really cool, how they work. I'm going to try to summarize it. Again, this is my understanding. I have published traditionally with uh, two houses, one publishing house. I've had uh, several contracts. So this is my understanding of how trad works, traditional publishing works. Um, these are the editorial houses. You, you think of, uh, you know, the editor, the designer, the marketing director, the, the every, everybody on one roof, like, you know, in the, the building in New York City, um, the big, you know, sitting around the boardroom talking about what's going to sell. They sell their, their books, their paperbacks, sorry, that's what I was saying, directly to Barnes and Noble and Borders, or Barnes and Noble, and, um, uh, the grocery stores, like the, the stores that you're going to find, Walmart, you know, Walmart's got a whole list there too. Uh, in order to get into those traditional publishers, there's two, there's one main way, and then there's one way that's like kind of working now, um, thanks to the internet. The traditional way is you find yourself an agent. This is the advice I give to people who have written a book and would like to have it traditionally published. Figure out what agents you need. And to do that, you go and you find your uh, 25 comparative books or more, 
find them all. And you know the top selling books in the genre you want to publish in because you read in that genre, right? Unless you don't, I don't know. I mean, I read hard sci-fi sometimes and I don't publish there, but I know what the best books are. I can go onto, again, Amazon lists and figure out what my the top selling lists of the top books are. And then from there, I figure out which books are the most familiar to me to, or most similar to the book that I have just written. And then I take those lists and I go through and figure out who that author's agent is. And that's what you need to do. So if you find an agent that shows up more than twice, contact that agent. That sounds like that agent might be a good fit for you. And then when you contact the agent, you say, hi, this is me. I mean, agents have their websites. They tell you what they want. But then you say, this is my book and these are the comps. These are my comparable books. Since you liked XYZ, you might like ABC, that sort of thing. That agent will then say, no, thank you. This isn't for me. Or which is, you know, the rejection letters we get all the time. <laughs> or so be warned. Um, or the, um, they'll send back and they'll say, yes, this is, I've, I've sold XYZ and ABC to, uh, to a big name publisher, Harlequin or Random House. So I can sell your book too. Yay. And that's what they're doing. They're taking that book and they are going to go to the editors at Harlequin or the editors at Avon or Random House or Penguin or whatever. And they're going to say, Hey, Tim, cause we're on a first name basis. Cause we're buddies. Do you want this book? This book is like XYZ. And I think it's really great. And I think it'll sell well. And if the editor goes for it, the editor is going to purchase that book from the author, base, basically. No, not really. That's not true. Okay. Um, the point is the agent at that point is going to get a cut of the sales. It depends for what agent, <laughs> I mean, what your agent is. I have never had an agent, so I don't know what the, let's 10%. I know that it's, you know, between five and 15, usually, depending on what the, the contract says. So the, so the point is the agent is super helpful because they've got the in and that's really great, but you're then going to have to give up a section, a, a chunk of the money. I mean, not a huge chunk, but a chunk. Thanks to the internet, there is a small percentage now of editors that are willing to accept submissions directly from the public. So you don't need an agent. You're allowed to say, dear Mr. Editor, I think you'll like this book a lot because it's comparable to XYZ, which you published. I think you should look at it. The book then goes into a big pile to be read. I think it's like, each, each publisher is different. They'll tell you it's six to eight weeks. And if you haven't heard back by 10 weeks, message them or e email them, that sort of thing. It's, it's called a slush pile because it's a huge pile of books that like they just have to slog through to figure out who they want to buy. Whereas if you've got an agent, they kind of like, you know, slip it in front of the editor. <laughs> once that happens, once the, you've gotten the editor's attention, once the editor says, yes, I'm going to take a chance on this book, or no, it's not a chance, it's amazing, I, it's going to sell a million, um, then the, the editor um, starts the process, and the process is different for everyone. It's usually several edits back and forth, the editor will read through it and tear it apart developmentally and say, Caroline, I need you to change this, that, and the other thing. Um, you know, the, I need the hero to die at the end. No, that's not true. That never happens in historical romance. But sometimes those developmental edits can be really big, right? Huge changes to the whole story. I, want, I think that the main character should be a hockey player instead of a football player. Well, that changes everything whatever. Once you've made those changes, sometimes the book is perfect and you don't need to do that. Once you've made those changes, the editor's then going to go through another pass and another pass back and forth to get the wording right. And then we're going to proofread it. And then meanwhile, they're talking with their graphics team and their designers and their cover edit artists and their marketing people. And then they come up with a date to publish and the publication date is based on not on you, but what else they've got publishing at that time. And then, and then they release it. Some really big publishing houses are going to release it with a lot of fanfare and a lot of marketing support and a lot of um, a lot of money. Basically, they're going to dump a lot of money into into billboards and advertisements and and internet ads and all sorts of things. Other publishers are not quite as big, and they're not going to be able to put that much money into marketing, that much fanfare. And that I mean that's okay, it happens. Um, but just be warned that then they expect you to do that. Um, you're going to have to publish and market, or you're going to have to market yourself either way. 
but just kind of before you sign a contract, make sure you know what you're getting. Okay, I will say that when you are traditionally published, it is a smaller percentage that comes to you because the publisher is putting out the money up front. They are paying for the editor, the designer, the marketing, everything. They, if you've got a paperback deal, they are paying to publish the paperback. So they're gonna publish 100,000 paperbacks and then hope to make it back. If you have a paperback deal, you're making some like pennies on every sale. I don't know, maybe maybe 10 cents on 50 cents. I don't know, I'm, I'm pulling this out of my head. Um, so that's why marketing is so important because if you're only making 50 cents a book, you need to market the heck out of it so that you can make a lot of it. Okay. The second type of publishing, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through. The second kind of publishing is indie publishing, which is what I do, indie or self-publishing. Um, there's a stigma to indie publishing, which I see a lot. And I, I see when I talk to people that anyone can do it. Literally anyone can publish a book. I told you how I published my first book. And you can do that too. Anybody can do that too. My kid can do that. <laughs> Okay, and that is a stigma, but we will come back to that. Um, we'll talk about how it works, how you get up there. Um, okay, here's how I write, here's how I publish a book. I write my book. This can take, um, I've, I've written, I wrote a book a couple of weeks ago in only a week uh, because my books tend to be shorter. Okay, if I'm writing a book that's only 30,000 words, I can write it in five days. It's brutal, it hurts to write 6,000 words a day. But I have friends who can write 10 to 12,000 words a day without breaking their hands, apparently. <laughs> I mean, I remember when writing 1,000 words a day was a big deal. So my, my prefer I like to write about 3,500 words a day. That's about one chapter for me. Um, but anyhow, so I'm writing this book. It can take, let's say, uh, three weeks. The shorter books, because I'm publishing so often. All right, let's go with two weeks, three weeks. I write it, I finish it, I edit it. I edit my books twice on my own to know what I need to say. I am a big believer in the fact that no one person can catch every, everything that's wrong. So the first thing I do is send it off to my developmental editor. Um, she is a reader who understands the genre really, really well. And that's what you need if you're gonna be publishing in fiction. You need someone else who understands your genre to read it and say, no, I think the hockey player should be a football player or whatever. This is, you know, there's, this is something that's really big and really wrong. My developmental reader also does all of my um, timeline checks for me. She's the one that goes through and says, you know, the characters were here and now they're here. You got to figure this out. Um, I, I get it back. I do my revisions. Uh, then I send it off to my editor, editor, who actually is on this call. I saw her comment earlier, <laughs> CM Wright. Hi. Um, and uh, sometimes I give uh, CM more uh, time than others <laughs> to, to edit a book, depending on what the, um, the release schedule is. She can get the books done in a week if she doesn't have anything else going on and doesn't need to eat. Otherwise, you know, it can take a couple of weeks. I get the book back. I make the revisions that uh, she suggests. Uh, I'm a terrible, absolutely terrible with commas. She'll tell you, I don't understand how commas work. And that's okay because I have an editor. She's saying yes. See, I have an editor to know how commas work and I don't need to. <laughs> then once she gets it back to me and I make those changes, um, I send it off to my proofreaders. I, again, believe very strongly that not one person can't catch all mistakes and that's okay. I have uh, two different rounds of proofreaders. So one proofreader gets it, then the next proofreader gets it after that one is done. And then I send it out to my advanced readers. Uh, they usually get it about a week before the book releases and they are under strict orders to tell me when they find typos and sometimes they do. And that is the way that I make sure when I publish my book, it is um, as typo free. <laughs> as possible. I don't know how else to say that. As good. As, as structurally um, good. Meanwhile, I have contracted with my cover artist to design the front cover. I, I trust my cover artist implicitly. She does amazing, beautiful, lovely work, um, often without my input. Often I say, Aaron, I would need a book that's set in the Old West that evokes Disney's Little Mermaid 
and the main character is a gypsy. Good luck. And she'll do it. It's amazing. And then she gets it back to me and I'm like, this is amazing. It's beautiful. Um, I think I've dropped most of, oh, all right. So like, here's one. I showed you beauty earlier, right? There's absolutely no doubt in your mind what this is, right? That's, that's clearly a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. You've got the stagecoach in the background, the big blue gown. That's clearly Cinderella. She's having a delicious fun with all of my Highlanders right now. I love these. I went to her and I said, Erin, I need you to make me covers that evoke the sensuality and lushness of Regency era books, except make them medieval. And she said, are you crazy? There's no medieval cover models out there. And I said, you figure it out. She's done a great job. <laughs> so I published the book um, with, with all the typos have been found. R rarely do people find typos in my published books because I have so many, so, such an editing team. I've published it with a, with a professional cover. Um, then I start doing my ads. I put different levels of money into different ads based on where the book stands in the series. And right now I'm really lucky that my husband handles a lot of my ads for me, which is good because then I don't have to learn how to do more ads. <laughs> I've only got so much space in the brain. Um, <sighs> It's, it's a lot of work. I would say half of my job is writing books and the other half of them is, is the publishing and, and all the other stuff that comes along with it. The payoff is that I make more money than a traditionally published author would uh, per book. And that is because I pay my editor and my cover artists up front as opposed to giving the publisher a cut forever. Does that make sense? So after I make back whatever I paid, everything else is profit. A traditionally published author will be paying a percentage, not only to the agent, but also to the publisher for the indefinitely for the length of the book, the book's run. Um, we did talk about paperbacks versus eBooks. I've lost my Kindle. Oh, there it is. Okay, here's the deal though. Um, Traditional publishers publish on both now. That's that's what's so interesting. Uh, you, we talked about instant gratification. That book that I ordered via paperback, it'll be here in two days. I can get that on Kindle, deliver it instantly that morning. That's that's really cool because publishers have done are doing both paperback and and Kindle. Indie publishers are doing both Kindle and paperback. I will tell you that ninety. 5% of my um, purchases, uh, readers buy on Kindle or Barnes and Noble or iBooks. Most of my books are exclusive to Kindle, which means that readers can read them in Kindle Unlimited, which is a $10 subscription service. So you pay $10 a month and you can read for free as many books as you want, as long as they are in Kindle Unlimited. The author gets a small percentage of them. <laughs> not, not a lot, but it's there. Um, but that's a, that's a real benefit for, for publishing on Amazon Kindle. So my books are never going to be in a grocery store. They're not going to be on the uh, shelf at Barnes and Noble, but I'm not being paid peanut uh, um, cents on the dollar. I don't know how else to say that. Instead of being paid seven cents for paperback. I'm being paid, you know, a big, a bigger chunk of each, sale for ebook. The downside is that I have to do all the work and I have to put out the money up front because I am indie, self-published. Um, that we talked about the stigma. Well, I talked about the stigma. I'm rambling. You're listening. The stigma of, uh, of self-publishing. I said, anybody can do it. And it's true. Anybody can do it. The trick is to do it well. I like to think I do it well. I listed my editorial team. I listed um, everybody I have that helps make my books awesome. If my kid writes a book, I'll still publish, you know, I'll, I'll let him, <laughs> that's a bad example. Anybody can publish a book is the point. The trick is to do it well. Now for years and years, it was the editors at the traditional publishing houses, Random House, Avon, Harlequin, whatever, that told us if this book was good enough, told us if, if this author was good enough, right? 
because that's how books get published. Is it's it's up to that editor to read it. I mean, we've all heard the story about how J.K. Rowling was um, rejected like fifty-seven times or whatever before somebody took a chance and published Harry Potter. Yes, that's what happens. These are the the I don't want to say gatekeepers, but the the editors are the ones that tell us if this is a good enough book. We don't have that in indie publishing, which is cool. We are based on our our. our decision if the book is um good enough is based on the readers buying habits it's literally voting the readers get to vote the readers are the ones that say i like caroline lee's books i'm going to purchase her next one and that's um that's super cool as i said i have been published by a publishing house i know that my books are good good enough to be published by a publishing house i just choose not to you will see if you go in and care. If you look at the top, the top ranks of Amazon sellers these days, again, I'm talking romance. I don't troll through all of the other genres, but you'll see many of those are independently published because, um, well, there's lots of different reasons, but for me, it's the money. I can support my family as an indie author and I would not be able to do that as a, as a traditional author. Okay, and it's like 8.48, I know we started late, but I will just reiterate the fact that the, the Kindle revolution revolutionized books, how we read books, how we interact with books, and how we, um, how we get books, how books are gotten to us. <laughs> okay, you, I'm, I'm assuming some, uh, many of you have at least purchased a book on Kindle before. You understand how it works. It's, it's, it's there. It's immediate. It means that we are seeing changes in the traditional publishing world thanks to the indie world. Ten years ago, my job was not possible. I could not indie publish ten, twelve years ago. <laughs> um, this is this is totally new. This is an entirely new job that has come up. The Kindle itself revolutionized things, but that allowed the indie world to come in and publish and, and revolutionize things. And that's frankly amazing. Like, isn't that neat? This one little bit of technology has changed how we read, not just how we read books, but how I publish books, how you get books, how we think about books. Oh, that was good. Okay, going back to the pin I stuck in earlier. A traditionally published author might be able to publish two to four books a year. I don't know. Okay. Um, the, the book I'm waiting on, I've been waiting on for a year. She, she has been publishing that one for a year now. Um, because that has to do with the traditional publisher's house that they've got a hundred authors they have to schedule around, right? Not me. I've only got one author I have to schedule around and it's me. So I can publish what I want when I run. And that means if I want to type my fingers to the bone and publish 22 books in a year, I can, as long as my editor is willing to continue editing as many books. Um, that has, that's also part of the revolution. Just because we can, we can put it, put them out so quickly. As long as, if I can write it in three weeks, I can have it in your hand in three weeks. You don't have to wait a year. And that's just neat. I mean, as a reader, that's cool. As an author, it's super cool too. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's that's my that's my summary on the state of publishing today. the The future is digital. <laughs> um, I don't mind continuing to to answer questions as long as we need to. I think my husband's putting the kids to bed. Do you <laughs> so, want Caroline? Do you want to me to read you the questions from the chat, or do you want to pick them out from the chat? How would you like to do that? Um. Can you do it? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to read through um, some of the questions that were asked. Um, the first one that I saw was, do readers ever complain that there are too many um, releases to keep up with? No, it's been my experience that most readers, hmm, this is a, the readers that read in my genre are in, 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 insatiable. I mean, they're getting, they're reading I've got some readers that are reading one book a day. So 
they finish my book in a day and then they just go find 12 other books to get them through until my next release, that sort of thing. So no, <laughs> nobody complains. They're excited about it. And that's why authors cross promo. We say, hey, I've finished reading my book. Or if you've finished reading my book, go read Laura Stapleton's latest release. That's uh, sort of Another question is, do you stick to specific hours for writing? Like, no. what does your day look like? It's, it's pretty, it's pretty wicked. <laughs> when the kids were in school, I wrote during school hours. <laughs> now the school is out and that we're all um, free for alling anyhow, and that I've got so many books out. I'm often, it's, it is literally the first thing I think of when I wake up in the morning before my eyes even open. I think what's on the, what are we going to write today? What has to happen in today's chapter? Um, another, writing until then. another question is what rights do you have to give up if you publish with Amazon? Do you, do you keep your copyrights or what, what is that? Yes. So if you're publishing on Amazon by yourself, it is your book. It is an Amazon will actually go to bat for you. Um, if there's issues with copyright, because it's in Amazon's best interest that you retain your, your rights. Um, if you publish with a publishing house, I don't, under, I, I don't, I don't want to, don't quote me legally on the publishing house on how the rights work for that. I know it belongs to the publishing house. The book is theirs. And then you get it back after a certain amount of time, but that's not the, on Amazon, everything is yours. As an indie author, do you recommend enrolling in Kindle Unlimited? That's a really tough question. <laughs> and I don't know that I can get into it. It is different from, for everybody and it's different for every genre. So I would say, um, do your research, figure out what is selling in your genre. And the difference is if you're in Kindle Unlimited, you are, you've got this fantastic audience that is like they're insatiably reading because they get free unlimited books that they get to read. If you're not in Kindle Unlimited, you can publish on um, Apple and iBooks and Kobo. So it, it really depends on your genre. I would say if you were just starting out and you're brand new, Kindle Unlimited is pretty useful because you can reach that audience. That's how I did it. I was able to reach the, the people who had never heard of me, but they were willing to take a chance on me because my book was essentially free for them to read. Um, do you, how do you find your readers in your editing arrangement, your pre-readers, how do you find them? I have a, um, a Facebook group. I, I practically live on Facebook and I would adore it if all of you came and found me on Facebook <laughs> because that's, that's where I do a lot of my marketing. And if I'm not writing, I'm, I'm living on Facebook. I have a group called Caroline's Cohort, which is loads of fun. We have about 700 people in it. And a smaller subset of that is Caroline's ARC team. Um, ARCs are advanced reader copies. I do a, actually my husband does, every time I publish a new book, he goes in, he sets up an ARC giveaway, so the first 25 people to sign up get uh, free advanced copies. In exchange, they are promising to write a review. That's how it works. They're also promising to tell me if they find any typos. <laughs> um, there was a question that said, any plans to go the Penny Read route and expand to become an indie publishing house? Ooh, that's, that's, that's a cool thing these days. Um, no, we might, we actually, my husband and I talked about it for a while last year at this point. No, um, basically it's, it's a, it's a really, really successful indie author who is willing to put their, their oomph, their steam behind other authors and, um, publish the other authors for them. Uh, and in exchange, they take a, a cut, the publishing house takes a cut. It's really cool. And it was like a, an advancement I didn't even get into, but it's like the one step beyond the indie, uh, being an indie author, being an indie publisher, which makes you a big publisher. And now we're back to square one. At this point, no, but thank you for asking. We had a couple of questions about how you market, um, about your ads, where you push your ads, um, about marketing online, how much that costs, that kind of thing? Uh, I, I can't really talk about cost just because my husband is the one <laughs> that's out there pushing the buttons each day. Um, my three main ads 
uh, and and you'll find I think this is the case across a lot of romance is um, Facebook ads where we are uh, relying on Facebook algorithms to choose readers based on their interests. So you, we've all heard the jokes about how Facebook knows everything about us, right? We talk about ceiling fans and then amazingly there's a, an ad for a ceiling fan. I don't know if that's the truth, okay? <laughs> but I do know that Amazon can tell me uh, these are the ages and the locations and things that these readers might be interested in. And based on that, we can form a lookalike audience over here, that sort of thing. So I do a lot of uh, Facebook advertising. Um, I do a lot of Amazon advertising. If you are do a search, if you go to amazon.com right now and search uh, Caroline Lee eBooks or Caroline Lee Kindle or anything, Caroline Lee will pop up. Uh, the first couple of responses are going to be sponsored ads. Now, hopefully those sponsored ads are my books because I'm paying for them. <laughs> but as sometimes other people have targeted me as an author and say, if you're searching for Caroline Lee, you might be interested in this. So if you go into any Amazon search and you see a sponsored ad, that's what that is. It's, it's, it's the author or the publisher paying for that. And the third place I do my marketing and putting a, a pitch in here is for BookBub. And I, if you're a voracious reader, I hope you're on BookBub. Uh, BookBub is a pretty cool uh, free and discounted book site where you, as a reader, tell BookBub what genres you like, and they will send you an email every day with either free or discounted books in that genre. Again, only eBooks, but that's amazing. So like, that's how you find your new authors, right? And that's how you find your new, anybody, any, your new series to read. So bookbub.com if you're a voracious reader. We had a question about how far ahead you are in your writing, i.e. like, what are you writing right now and when is that publishing date expected? You're just judging me, aren't you? <laughs> Ideally, I'm writing several months ahead. In reality, it's 2020 and the entire world just <laughs> so... <laughs> At any given point, I'm writing the book that's due next. <laughs> I just sent my editor the book that has to come out on September 11th. <laughs> and I told her, please, good luck, please hurry. <laughs> uh, right now I'm, I'm writing the book that comes out September 24th. Uh, but after that, I hope to be ahead of the game. I will start working then on the book that comes out in November. So I'll be a little bit far ahead. <laughs> Uh, there was a question about libraries and whether or not libraries have independently published books. Yes, that is a fantastic question. And as readers, I will tell you this too. Okay, if an author is not in Kindle Unlimited, that means her books are wide. They are, in, as we said, Nook and iBooks and everything. They are also in the library networks and that's really cool. So hopefully you are all aware of the fact that, that you, can, you can borrow, let's say rent, you can borrow books, eBooks from your library. It's particularly handy if you're quarantined, right? You get on the website, you say, these are the books I want and they'll, they'll email it to your, to your Kindle. It's more complicated. I'm not the tech person. Uh, if your book is published to a library option, the librarians can buy that book and make it available to their, to their patrons. However, they don't know about it because as an author, excuse me, I don't have the, the, the big publishing house power that's calling up the libraries and telling them you need to buy this book. So what I rely on is my readers to contact their local libraries and say, Caroline Lee's latest book is available on uh, in the library options, Hoopla or all the other ones. Please buy it for me. And it's been my experience that it works. You're a library patron and the librarian wants to know what you read. So if you say, put it, uh, you know, just randomly, Caroline Lee, <laughs> if, you, if you go to the library and say, uh, or email the library and say, I'd like you to purchase Caroline Lee's latest books, they often will. So it's up that's, to you, is the point. That's great news for, for library <laughs> folks. Um, another question that we received was, 
Uh, can you tell us some authors in your genre that you admire and recommend? Holy moly. How long do we have? <laughs> okay, that's a, that is that might be a longer. I will say, um, I know for a fact that Laura Stapleton is watching right now, and she gave herself a little shout out, and I'm glad. Laura writes um, in a couple different genres, but I met her through uh, historical Western, so cowboys and cool stuff like that. Um, Scottish, there's there's so there's so many Scottish books out there. So many authors, and that's what oh that's a really cool thing about. The, the published author aspect is that I, I have books that authors that I've been reading for years that I read when I was younger that I read 20 years ago and now I know them and I'm hanging out with them and that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, gosh, off the top of my head. No, you're making it hard. Celeste Barclay writes uh, uh, Scottish. The uh, Madeline Martin. Guys, come on. <laughs> Message me on Facebook and I'll definitely send you a list. <laughs> How about the book that you keep referring to that you pre-ordered that's coming out this summer? What author is that? <laughs> Tessa Dare. Tessa Dare is one of my all-time favorite historical romance authors because she's got such comedy, like laugh out loud stuff in her books. And as uh, her, her later books, her more recent books are literally laugh out loud. So she has the book, this is book four in a series. And of course, I don't know the name because I haven't read it yet. Um, but book three in the series came out last summer and I've read it three times since then because it makes me laugh so much. Um, we had a question about what the costs are to um, publish eBooks. Do, do you, what are the costs that you incur to do that type of publishing? Um, for an indie author, for me, when I publish, I, it costs absolutely nothing to press publish. My costs come from paying my cover designer and paying my editors. And that will change drastically depending on what cover artist or editors you have. I, I will say, I will tell you this, if you are interested in going this route, there are lots and lots of good Facebook groups. If you're on Facebook, join. The one off the top of my head that's not genre specific is called, actually, no, I don't think it's genre specific. Um, Club Indie is really big. Um, there's also one called 20 Books to 50K, where the 20 and the 50 are both numbers, 20 Books to 50K. Um, and both of those are very supportive and full of posts and pinned posts to get you where you need to be. So there's so many posts in there. Help me, I need to find an editor. And then there's gonna be people listing their editors, um, helping helping them find, I worked with so-and-so and I really like, this is how much they cost, this is how. So I can't give you an answer specifically for, for prices for the editors and the, the cover artists and the marketing, but go join one of those, those groups and you'll find specifics. I think that this kind of ties into that question. Um, are there any professional associations you'd recommend joining before, during, and after writing your novel? I am a member of Romance Writers of America, RWA. RWA um, has gone through a lot of restructuring in the last year. If you'd asked me six months ago, I would have said, maybe this is not the time to join. I have rejoined now. I think that this is um, a really good organization. It has the potential to be even better. It's, it's the organization that will go to bat for the romance world. And I really appreciate that. There have been lots of times when I've had to go up against um, Amazon with issues of copyright where somebody challenged my copyright and RWA went to bat for me. There have been issues with, um, oh, just, just all sorts of things. I also really like that RWA has local chapters. And of course we're not meeting because quarantine, <laughs> but uh, your local chapter of your RWA is gonna be a, the face-to-face -face meeting with people who are passionate about doing what you do. And that's really cool. Again, this is just romance specific, right? Non-romance specific, NINC, N-I-N-C. 
national independent novelists club corporation company i don't know um is is amazing however that you you have to make a certain amount of money and you have to be able to prove it in order to join them they are incredible when it comes to the professional world like telling you what's going to work absolutely amazing but again you have to prove that you're at a certain level i would say just beginning those facebook groups are going to be awesome and I don't have a list of them, <laughs> I'm sorry. But the two that I mentioned, Club Indie, where Indie is spelled with an I-E, and 20 books to 50K. Um, very passionate people, very passionate people about helping others too, which is really cool. So check those out. I'm gonna do a last call for questions um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm getting my plug. Uh, Caroline has um, some free books if you sign up for her newsletter and that link will also be in the survey that you receive tomorrow. Um, and if there are no other questions in the chat, oh wait, we got one, one more. Any advice for trying to make a break into a market that's super competitive or saturated? Um, mm. Do you just recommend going for it? Cross promo is your friend. Um, you, you are writing in this genre because you read in this genre, presumably, and you read in this genre, you know your favorites, you know the, the authors, and reach out to them, connect with them on social media, um, make friends with them so that when your book does come out, you, you're recognized. If you've made a really great connection with them, they will hopefully share your book. They will give you plugs where, the, where in their reader group or with their friends or when they're doing chats like this and that's invaluable um newsletters I, I i just posted my my newsletter link so if you go to my newsletter there's going to be plenty um of information because i'm publishing every other week basically um but one of the things i do is every month i send out a a newsletter with links to other people's books i'm like hey my friends have these these are the the eight new releases in Scottish romance this month from my friends these are the eight new releases in historical westerns this month from my friends and that's pretty cool that helps you as the readers get new books from authors you've never heard of and it helps the authors get traction outstanding thank you so much Caroline we really appreciate you spending your evening with us um, thank you to all of our alumni and uh, our Lafayette community for joining us this evening as well. Um, I just want to let everyone know that our next uh, Connect Ed talk is called Gendered by Design with Professor Mary Armstrong. And that's on Tuesday, September 15th at 8 p.m. You can view and register um, for that on leopardlink.lafayette.edu. You can see the recording of this and other Connect Ed uh, programs. We look forward to seeing you soon and have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. <laughs>